so good morning to everybody. My name is Laura, and I like strange things. People say, my friends say, is that I have an explosive character, and that's why we start today with an explosion. Actually, it's a simulation of an explosion. It's a simulation of a supernova explosion. This is what happens sometimes to very massive stars. They explode. Uh, now you might think that I am an astronomer and I look at stars. That's not the case. I actually a physicist that works at accelerators, so I do experiment on the Earth, on the ground, actually underground. And the final goal of my research is try to understand what is left after this supernova explosion. Eventually, what can be left after supernova explosion is either a black hole or a neutron stars. And today I'm going to tell you um, about the puzzle. This puzzle is called the Hyperon puzzle. We will now uh, know what an Hyperon is, in short, and what has this to do with neutron star. And I'm uh, going to show you how we solve this puzzle doing experiment at accelerators. But first of all, we have to know the object of our desire, which are neutron stars, right? What are neutron stars? I told you they are left over after supernova explosions. And to our knowledge, they are the most dense uh, stars in the universe today. So most dense, what does it mean? They have a very small radius. Um, 10, 15 kilometers. I mean, think about the Earth radius. This is 6,400 kilometers. And they have a super large mass between 1.5 and 2 solar masses, means mass of the sun. So they are very heavy and very small, which means they are very dense. And actually, we do not know what is inside neutron stars. We know that on the crust, we have neutrons, uh, maybe electrons, things that we can uh, kind of measure. But we don't know what is inside. It's, it's not like that, that I can just take a shuttle, go there, make a whole drill, and see what is inside. So our job is try to make experiments in the uh, accelerator, at the accelerator, and make hypotheses about what can be inside. And then, after I make an hypothesis, I can call my astronomer friend on the phone and ask him about what he measure about neutron stars and see whether my hypothesis do match with the measurements. So what we want to do is actually write a recipe. So that's why I'm showing you a recipe book. And this recipe book at the moment is blank because we do not know what is in neutron stars. And if you look at the first picture uh, on the left side, you see a ball, yeah? a sphere, your neutron stars, and then you see little circles. So now, since I call them neutron stars, the easiest hypothesis is that there are neutrons in neutron stars, right? I mean, what are neutrons? Uh, those are particles which are not elementary particles. Indeed, in nature, the smallest particles we know are called quarks, and we have six of them. And neutrons uh, are composed of the two most simple quarks, which are called up and down. You see there, green is down, red is up. A neutron has three quarks, two down, one up. So basically, you see in this first picture, little circles with three quarks. Each, each of these little circles is a neutron. Now, this is an hypothesis. But there is another hypothesis in the middle, uh, which can uh, look very similar to you, but for us it's not the same, because in the first hypothesis, the neutrons are kind of separated, while in the middle, all the quarks are kind of mixed together. You don't have neutrons anymore, you have a quark star. And for us physicists, this makes a huge difference, if quarks are bound together or they just lose. So, two hypotheses, neutron stars, quark star, but that's not what I do. I do something beyond. And then I imagine that 
uh, instead of having neutrons in neutron stars, I have another kind of particle, which are called hyperons. And what are those hyperons? Basically, you take a neutron, you see, and then you replace one D quark with a strange quark. And strange is really the name of this quark. This is really called like that, because when they discover it, well, they find it kind of peculiar that they found a third quark, and they call it strange. So, hyperons are basically like neutrons, just a bit different. They have strange quark inside. And my question is actually whether hyperon star exists. So, neutron stars, where in the middle of the stars, you have neutron, but also hyperons. Might seem boring to you, maybe it is, but actually I like it. I told you I like strange things. So now, how can we do that? I want to really be frank with you and really show you some science, really some science concept. And then I have to tell you what an equation of state is. You need to understand that. Equation of state means that you know the response of a system to pressure. Imagine you have a pillow, right? And you try to squeeze it. You will be able to squeeze it. Then you say that the equation of state of a pillow is soft. If you take a wooden box and you try with your hand to apply pressure, you won't have so much response. You will say that the equation of state of a system is rather stiff. So in few words, stiff equation of states, it means that if you apply pressure, the system is not going to be very compressible. The equation of states is fundamental to understand neutron stars. So you need an equation of states if you want to say something a neutron star. So the equation of states is what we are after. What does it mean? And now, guys, I show you some graph. Yeah. Um, the equation of states, I told you, is the response of the system to pressure. And normally, we physicists, we make a plot. Pressures versus density on your left-hand side. So if a density increases, the pressures increase. This line is an equation of states. And then if you do some math, this equation of states tells you exactly how the mass to radius uh, relationship in a neutron star would be. So here you see now the connection between the formula I might find out in my experiment and the mass and radius of neutron stars who astronomers can measure. It. And you really have a mapping one-to-one. -one. Green goes with green, red goes with red, blue goes with blue. So now, if you know the equation of states, you know about neutron stars. Now, hyperons. Why do hyperons play a role at all? Why should I produce hyperon inside neutron stars? If you put neutrons and hyperons um, on a scale, Actually, hyperons are a bit heavier. So normally, nature doesn't like to produce heavier particles because in order to produce heavier particles, you need more energy. So nature is greedy, tends to you know, put itself in the situation of spending less energy possible. So why you could produce um, neutron, stars, neutron stars with hyperons? Now, imagine uh, you have only neutrons, OK? Um, how do you represent them inside the neutron stars? You put them in a box. You see? Here you see a box. And this neutron will be uh, piling up like you know, lasagna layers, right? On higher and higher energy level. And if you apply pressure, this energy level goes up and up. At some point, the system doesn't want to have neutrons anymore. It prefers to have new particles, hyperons. So that these yellow lines that you see there, uh, are kind of going down. So you transform neutrons into hyperons. I make you an example. You have a party, and you just invited nerdy mathematicians, boys. And this party is going to, I mean, all these boys are coming in, are coming in. The party is, get, is not getting any cool, right? At some point, somebody has the idea, OK, let's throw out the nerdy boys, and let's get in the cool female art students. So that's exactly what is happening here, guys. So at some point, you are tired of nerdy uh, neutrons, and you uh, bring in the cool, strange hyperons. That's how it works. So in few words, it must happen. Nature wants it. But then 
what is the puzzle? Then it happens, then I should not spend my time in doing anything here, right? No, there is a puzzle. Okay, let's go back to our equation of states. You remember, we have a one to one correspondence between the equation of state on your left hand side and the mass and radius of neutron stars. What happens now if all hyperons pop up, right? The party is getting cool, but unfortunately, your equation of states change shapes. It becomes softer. The system becomes more compressible. And what happened to the mass of neutron stars? The maximal mass of a neutron star goes down. Do we have a problem with that? Yes, we have. Because unfortunately, very heavy neutron stars have been measured. And this line that represents mass versus radius must go through the experimental data. It must go through. If it doesn't, then too bad. So, guys, that's the puzzle. They must be there, but they can't be there. What do we do? Eventually, this now goes back to interactions, right? So, actually, this hyperon inside the neutron star, they just don't sit there, but they speak to each other, to the neutrons. It's like the girls speaking at the party with the boys, right? And the interaction can be attractive or repulsive. And then if it is attractive or repulsive, this will change the equation of state, and this will change the mass versus radius of a neutron star. So my job is to find out this interaction, attractive or repulsive. How do you do that? Well, I am trying to tell you in a simplified way. We do experiment accelerators. Uh, we shoot beams, like you see here, bam, on nuclei, and then we produce particle. You see now an hyperon being produced. It goes through the nucleus, and then it goes out the nucleus. And it flies to your detectors, which is your high, which, which you measure particles. And now, what do we do? We make an experiment, and we look at pairs, or triplets of hyperons and neutrons, right? We look at them after they are produced, and we try to see whether they interact in an attractive wave or in a repulsive wave. And imagine, so you look at them, they're coming out of your reactions, and if they are tend to go against each other, close to each other, then you say, okay, they are interacting in an attractive way. If you, uh, on the way from the reaction to the detector, they are drifting apart, the interactions is repulsive. Let's go back to the party. At the party, one very strange girl, nice girl, I mean, she starts to talk with the nerdy mathematician and they, get, they leave the party together. So either they go home together, which then means that the interaction was rather attractive, or everybody goes to his place. So this is exactly the same uh, what we do in, uh, in physics. But obviously, in order to do so, uh, we just don't uh, have to talk about that, but also we have to build um, machines uh, which are able to see particles. And now you see here in a movie, which is not a simulation, but is an artistic representation of what we, are, we have really built at CERN, shows you how we do that. This is a big detector, five meters high, 10 meters long. You see particles that fly through this detector, they leave tracks. They leave really the signature of the passage. And this detector allows us to reconstruct this track. So each track is a particle. And if you reconstruct the track, you can really see whether the tracks go together or they are drifted apart. And you can really determine the interactions and then information about neutron stars. So here you see as really these detectors allow you to reconstruct the path of the particles in a three-dimensional way. It's really like a camera, you know? And things like that are built by my groups here in Munich and also by many other groups um, all over the world. So we are so-called experimentalists. Okay, I explained you the problem. I explained you what we're gonna do. And now, ta-da, 
that's the result. Sad. Extremely sad, guys. I mean, what's that? Not so spectacular, isn't it? Uh, after years of measuring and several million spent in building detectors, that's what we get out. So you see two plots, and you see black points and black boxes. Those are the experimental results that we produce and we publish in our job. So, and you see that these uh, plots are, so the experimental data are shown together with lines. So what are these lines? Those lines are theory, right? And in principle, if you look at uh, the plot on your right-hand side, you can see that there are two lines, right? In principle, if the data would be better, if the boxes would be smaller, we would be able to distinguish between the two lines, right? Because if the data sits on one line, they tell you, okay, this line is right. And this line tells you basically whether the interaction is attractive or repulsive for hyperon and neutrons. So basically, I told you a lie. We didn't solve the puzzle yet, so we are still working on that. But I hope I could uh, uh, convince you that this is something worth pursuing, because eventually, if we measure 10 times longer, and I am still very young, we can maybe find a solution. Also, I must say that we have also new open new measurements, because this year, really, 2017 is a great year for us, because gravitational waves won the Nobel Prize, uh, for physics, not only, but uh, in August, uh, we saw for the first time the signature of two neutron stars eating each other and producing like a sound, a very dim sound that we call gravitational wave signal. And we hope that many other signals like that will be measured in the next years, and this will give us more information to understand what is inside neutron stars. Thank you very much. Thank you.